My name is Carrie Williams. I'm with Enterprise Community Partners. I am uh, acting as a woefully inadequate substitute for M.A. Leonard today, who is out actually doing advocacy work um, at, a, at a meeting of our uh, Washington State Housing Trust Fund um, and was unable to be here. But uh, I'm a program staff here for Enterprise Community Partners, which means I work on all of our advocacy initiatives at a local, regional, and national level. Um, I just wanted to kind of get a, a, an idea of the folks in the room. Could you raise your hand if you're with any kind of governmental entity? And how about if you're with uh, sort of a, a planning entity, an MPO or? And how about a, a community-based organization? So there you go. <laughs> um, advocacy is obviously something that we all, uh, that we all work on. Um, and there's many definitions out there, but the, the one that we use at Enterprise is very simple, and that advocacy is the effort to influence an outcome. Uh, we're working, that's our effort, all of the various activities we do. The influence is the relationships that we form and the, um, the uh, ability that we have to uh, educate others and to build coalitions. And the outcome, obviously, is the, the vision for the future that we're all working on. Um, some brief components that I think may um, work across all of the uh, panelists' presentations that we'll hear today are these components that um, are the, the audience, the education, the relationships, funding, very important, and action, also very important. Um, enterprise, uh, just to give you a, a brief example of the sort of stuff that we work on, Enterprise's vision for the outcome of, small, of smart regional planning is that people of all income levels will live in homes linked to opportunity through accessible transit, bike, pedestrian, and other auto-free means of transportation. A safe, affordable home is a springboard to a good life, and for it to be a springboard, it needs to have those linkages to opportunity. So Enterprise ad advocacy efforts to influence this income, um, that the components policy decision makers, boards, and other funding decision makers, allies in terms of coalition building. Uh, the education is sort of distilling the message. How does affordable housing maximize the benefits of TOD? Uh, we have uh, everything from our TOD University program, which is um, very active in LA and will, and will be rolling out to others of our markets that sort of educate neighborhoods about what does TOD actually look like? What do we mean when we talk about transit-oriented development? And how can it benefit you, your life, your community um, in terms of uh, the, the benefits that it can bring both on an individual level and to our region? Uh, relationships that we build on an individual basis with elected officials or with uh, staff or with community-based um, organizations that help us build the trust that, that leads into a coalition that's very effective. Uh, funding, obviously, there's multi-pronged strategies simultaneously, working at a national level, working at a state level, working with foundations, and also working with um, government money that uh, can, can go into the final outcome. And then the action, I think, um, having an organization that has a strong track record of performing, of, of leading adv advocacy efforts that actually get something accomplished is really a, an important element of, um, of a successful advocacy campaign. So today we're going to hear from four different um, panelists from around the country. Um, I'm going to introduce them all here at the beginning, and then they'll speak to you one by one. Uh, we're going to begin with Deborah Scott. Deborah is the executive director of Georgia Stand Up, which is a think and act tank. I love that, not just a think tank, a think and act tank for working communities. Um, she has 25 years of experience um, as an organizer, trainer, expert implementer of complex mission-driven initiatives. She's worked for many uh, mayoral administrations in Atlanta, the Georgia Legislature, the Democratic National Committee, um, and her current um, effort is uh, what she'll talk to you about today, I think, which is the um, Beltline Task Force and the sort of Beltline Project in Atlanta that has, um, has, has been a great TOD initiative there. She'll be followed by Hilary Franz, which is our local um, representative here. Hilary is the executive director of FutureWise, 
and brings over 16 years of experience working on environmental, social, economic, and local government policy issues. She has served in government as a city council member, so she knows that side of it as well, and has spearheaded diverse coalitions of local, state, and national entities, developing several nationally recognized policies and programs around energy efficiency, renewable energy, innovative green building, and affordable housing. She's been very active in the Puget Sound Regional Council, growing transit communities, and, uh, and on many other uh, environmental um, advocacy efforts, including Puget Sound Salmon Recovery Council, Puget Sound Partnership Ecosystem Coordination Board, and National Star Communities Board. Hillary will be followed by Stephanie Reyes. Stephanie is the Senior Program Director at Green Belt Alliance. Um, she comes to us from the Bay Area. Uh, she, and she has over a decade of experience in land use planning, sustainable, equitable development. Stephanie leads the Greenbelt Alliance's Homes for All and Thriving Neighborhoods initiatives, managing research projects and advocacy campaigns. She previously held positions in communications and advocacy at EHC Life Builders, which is an affordable housing and homeless services nonprofit. She has a bachelor's degree from Brown University. And lest you think that we are too estrogen heavy here on this panel, <laughs> we will conclude. <laughs> we'll conclude our presentations with uh, Denny Zane, who's the executive director of Move LA, which he founded in 2007. <laughs> uh, Move LA um, is. Uh, it, initiated the campaign for Measure R, which I think Denny will be talking to us more about today, um, which, and, and then worked with LA Metro and Mayor Antonio Villarre, I never say this right. Villa. Villaregosa, yeah. <laughs> to create the 3010 plan, whereby 30 years of planning can be accomplished in 10 years, which is an amazing feat to any of us, especially who live here in Seattle. Um, <laughs> so we'll, we'll move on without further ado to the, um, the presentations, and um, afterwards, each, each panelist will take about 10 minutes to talk about their initiatives, and we'll hopefully have about 30 minutes for questions afterwards. So keep in mind um, things that you might want to uh, follow up with, with either all of them as sort of a theme, or with each one individually. Thank you. Deborah. Okay, so this is hard after lunch, right? So we need you to be awake, right? <laughs> so um, good morning or good afternoon. My name is Deborah Scott. I am the executive director of Georgia Stand Up, which is a think and act tank for working communities. And if our theme is many faces of advocacy, I thought that you needed to see many faces of advocacy. But before we get there, one of the, the, the tenets of what we do at Stand Up, we're based in Atlanta, Georgia, and we're part of a national network called the Partnership for Working Families. Um, any partnership people in the house? Yay! <laughs> um, so, and that's a community benefits uh, national network. Um, but part of what we do at Stand Up, we do organizing, advocacy, pol a policy institute, which is our deep learning institute. We'll take um, community members, faith leaders, students, put them in a room together for about eight weeks, and they learn from each other and cross-pollinate each other's movements. And, and that's one of our ways that we really do deep organizing. We've been doing this since 2005, and we trained over 330, 333 people so far. Um, and of course, leadership development, education, and, and capacity building. Our belief is, as an organization, our job is to help other organizations that are smaller, that may not have the capacity to do what we do, to get better at what they do. So we th I thought we'd show you faces and as we talk about many faces of advocacy because these are the faces that are often left out. These are the riders. These are the people that actually need transportation, not want transportation, but actually need transportation to get to work, to get to school, to take, ch take their kids to childcare. But they also want grassroots um, leadership, but they also want good quality grocery stores in their neighborhoods. 
So those are some of the pictures from our, some of our campaigns. One of the tenets of what we do is really about civic engagement, getting people involved from the ground level up. So when you think about these charrettes that we have and planning institutes that we have, you know, we have the pretty maps on the walls and we say, okay, which dot do you want? And go take your three dots and put those things on there. Well, our, our, our mission is to connect the dots for those people who may not be able to come to those charrettes and to make it more community friendly and to connect those communities with those processes as they're going along. Part of what we do at Stand Up is advocate for community benefits. And community benefits are a legally enforceable contract between the community coalition and that, those governmental agencies or that development process. And part of what we really try to do is to educate not only the city and the government, but also the private developers and the community that if you work together, you can actually have better projects. As a result of the work that we did, and we only have 10 minutes, so I'm talking fast, <laughs> but as a result of the work that we've done over the years, one of the projects we had was the Beltline Project. And the Beltline, you've probably heard about it in other conferences or even here. It's this whole notion to connect these neighborhoods that have been, um, been divided over all of these years by this light rail transit. And so our first question is, well, where does the train go? Because right now it was kind of going around in a circle once. <laughs> and so how does Mrs. Johnson leave her home and go to work on this belt line if it doesn't connect to the MARTA station? Um, or doesn't get her to her child care. It's great for those who have cars and transportation and need it as an entertainment loop, but does it really work for the residents in the community? And how do you make sure that there's a connection between those who live there now as we plan for those that are coming in the future? So one of the things that we were advocating for was local hire, that as you build out these train stations and as you build out this rail, that the community should actually get some of that work. And so we advocated for local hire provisions. But we always got the pushback of, well, but these people aren't qualified. They, they really don't have the skill set. And they, they're on drugs and all of those many things that people say about communities of color and not being able to be um, competitive for the workforce. So as, really as a challenge, we decided to interview people and to find out what it took to start a jobs training program. And so we talked to um, employers, we talked to apprenticeship directors, and we, we, everything that they said that was wrong with community folks, we developed our program so that it would be right. So we changed the time that people have to be at, in class to make sure that we know wherever the job is, they're gonna get there on time. We clothed them from their head to their toe because they said, well, they come to work with their pants down, you know, and, and they don't know sometimes that's, that's a cultural thing, right? So we make sure their pants are up, we give them the pants, we give them the hard, hard boots, hard, um, excuse me, the steel toe boots and the hard hats, and we give them certification, CPR, first aid, OSHA 10, all of those things to make sure that the community is work ready. But then we work with the developers and the city to place people. And so, so far we have trained 104 up till this, this last week, 104 um, community residents on job skills. And then this last class we had was all females. We started with 10 women and we actually graduated eight of them. One still has some work to do before she can graduate, but now we're to the, in the business of placing them. So they'll go to City Hall, they'll advocate for themselves. So we're not just saying that do this local hire policy, we're saying that you also have a skilled work, workforce that can take control of some of these jobs. So you'll see some of the pictures from our skills building. As we try to bookend what we do, both on the policy side and on the development side, the advocacy piece is the key that holds it together. They listen because we show up at City Hall with 100 people. You know, when you, and you know from, from, from planners, when five people come to a meeting, oh, that's good, that came out, 15, oh gosh. It's, but when you show up with 50 or 100, it's like, what's going on, you know? So part of what we try to do is to make sure as we really build from community from the ground up, we're, oftentimes we're in the room with the grass tops. We know grass top policy makers. We're the organization that brings grassroots to the grass tops so that there's a real connection between what's going to happen in the community, what should happen um, far reaching, and then who actually gets to benefit from the work. Thank you so much.
So I am Hillary Franz, and I am the executive of FutureWise, and we have been doing a lot at looking at the work we've been doing advocacy. We work statewide in every county of Washington State. We work all the way from our rural areas and our natural resource lands is in helping to move planning and policies on protection of farmlands to our waterways to our most urban areas like City of Seattle. I'm going to talk to you today about the advocacy work we've been doing in transit-oriented communities and sort of the evolution over the last two years of where we're going so that our advocacy work is even more informed. So since um, when we started in 2009 looking at transit-oriented communities, we found that most of the debates looked like this. They were mostly fair-based. Um, I have this saying that says people come together for two reasons. They come to either stop something or create something. And we were finding that most of the conversation was about stopping something. So we, as an organization, looked at our advocacy work and said, OK, we asked two questions. How well is our advocacy doing in actually achieving our performance goals in housing, in transportation, multimodal transportation, public space, economic uh, density, residential density, economic opportunity, mixed use, and health within our transit or in communities? And two, how do we start to change the conversation from a place of fear to a place of opportunity? How do we move it from a conversation where it feels like it's top down to bottom up? And we are in the beginning of this process of trying to look at how do we solve that and maybe come at it from a different where the community is actually working together and is able to feel part of the solution and understand the issues. So to do that, we've created sort of a five-step model that we are in the early play, uh, stages of implementing. And the first thing we've done is we've actually looked at all of King County where we're piloting this. It's the county you're sitting in right now. And we've actually mapped um, eight foundational community conditions for all of the county. And we're able to take it down to the city level and even down to the transit community level. Those conditions are food, access, health, facilities, education, how our schools are performing from their graduation rates to their test scores in math and reading to um, transportation, transit access and where those stops are and the level of service to public space, parks and recreation, to tree canopy and even economic opportunity. The second thing we're doing is then using that to make that data actually meaningful for the average citizen so that they can actually understand how their community is performing in context of other communities. And that allows them to create a story of what is working and what's not working and where do we want to go. And then that, the next step is actually engaging with our community-based organizations on the, part, on the ground, our citizens are in that community, our policymakers, and even our city planners to start to say, we want to change some of these foundational community conditions so that when we look out five years, 10 years after this, transit stations have been implemented with the new light rail and other yes, rapid transit that we're actually seeing that we're hitting performance goals. The next is building capacity in the community by helping to show how policy and planning can inform that. Developing those plans and policies for them based on what they want rather than what we think they want as an advocacy organization or as a city government and then helping secure those policies through advocacy. So this is the light rail transit uh, stations that are going to be going in. We are in the very early stages of this. Um, we have some communities that already have that station up and we have some communities that are in the process of going forward. We are taking those eight foundational community conditions and layering it over these transit stations to start to be able to show the community and the citizens how they're performing in each one of those areas. And I'm going to show you some of what that mapping looks like. I'm not showing you all of that mapping at this point because I only got 10 slides to be the teaser, and I'm not showing you at the county scale or the city scale. So this shows you, and by the way, those eight foundational community conditions, we broke it out on a pure equity lens, so we're able to show as to income level and as to populations of color. So this shows you Tukwila International Boulevard. How many people rode the light rail in from the airport? You went right through this area. In this community, over 124 languages are spoken in the school district. That's more than New York City schools. It has um, an area that has some of our highest um, populations of color and diversity. And as you can see, within that one half mile walk shed, we have a very high popula in income, we have a very low income level compared to many of our other locations. 
Here's how um, race and ethnicity play out as well in that one half mile walk shed. And now we put density, destinations, and transit into a performance to show how well is that community performing. And remember, this has already been built out. Okay, ideally we would have been ahead of it, and by this time, since it's been actually working, we'd be able to see some of the changes and improvement in performance. As you can see, if the performance target is 12 density dwelling units per acre, it's not doing very well right now. Two dense dwelling units per acre for employment it's also not doing very well right now, even to that standard. As the diversity of uses, to make sure that people have enough uses within that transit community to be able to actually get to grocery stores, to get to the kinds of retail services they want, um, it's doing better. Ideally, we'd be at 25 on the performance metrics that we've set forward. And transit availability, it's doing pretty good. As you can tell, it's a pretty high-functioning transit station. Walkability, this goes to access to the transit station. It goes to health. It goes to how people can get around and whether they can get to their basic services. You can see right now, we mapped every one of these through field survey as well as Google Maps to show to the policymakers and to the citizens that actually much of where they are, ability to walk and move around in a healthy lifestyle isn't there. Here's tree canopy. Every one of those areas is underperforming if we were looking at just having 20 to 40 percent tree canopy. We also map every one of the streets, because ideally you'd have a tree every 40 feet, just to give that kind of clean air, but also that sense of community and place that people want to convene. Here's how it's doing to design. And design for those planners in the room, this is about making sure you have safety on the street, right? Where people feel that they have a place to move, that they can have a place to congregate as community just on the street. And again, you can see it's not performing yet anywhere close to what we would say is a healthy performance standard for transit community. And here's affordable housing. And much of the challenge that this community is facing in affordable housing is that there has been affordable housing there. The size of the homes are too small to meet the size of the families. At the same time, rents have been going up because you now have a transit station, so the demand is going up. This only shows you part of the picture. There's much more data that we have that shows that a lot has have to happen in this area for our policies to get right, to actually make this a healthy functioning community in the next 10 years. And this shows you where land value is going. So what we do then is take all of that data, which right now may not be that meaningful for the average person, and we are able to bring it to them in a story frame so that they can use that to say, well, let me add to that. Here's what I experience every day when I go on the street. For example, there's, I didn't show you the parks and recreation. There's none in that entire walk shed. And there isn't even in the one kilometer walk shed outside of that. And most of the families there have said, I can't even have my child walk to a public park or recreation field, okay? So those community conversations then help set up the framework for what is the vision for your community? How do we move you from a fear base of what's coming, I'm afraid of it, I'm not gonna be able to afford my home, to for me to be happy here, I need these things. I want to empo be empowered to actually change the dynamic and we help give them the tools to make that happen. Um, and some of our community-based organizations are in the audience that we actually work with because obviously we shouldn't necessarily, be, as a planning policy, be the face of that, but we give them the tools so they can make those things happen in their community. I want to start off with a question for you all. Uh, how many of you have heard of California's Senate Bill 375, Sustainable Communities and Climate Protection Act? Oh, good. I'm actually really happy to see that the answer is kind of few people because this is a law that I feel like has gotten a lot of hype, which is kind of only partially merited. Uh, but I'm going to tell a story today of how advocacy organizations capitalized on this, you know, kind of so so law to. Uh, to use uh, regional funding to incentivize good local land use. So first, a little bit of background on this law that I, uh, with its mixed, mixed reputation. Uh, so 
Senate Bill 375 passed in 2008. Uh, it requires the state to set land use and transportation related greenhouse gas emission reduction targets for each region in California. And then each region needs to create a region wide land use and transportation blueprint called a sustainable community strategy, which will meet those greenhouse gas emission reduction targets. So it's all about transit-oriented development, pushing for more options to get to allow people to get out of their cars, et cetera. And then the most exciting yet controversial element of this law is uh, it links transportation funding to these region-wide blueprints. So in theory, this bill was sold as we're gonna you know, link up how we spend our money with how we're developing and uh, the, the outcomes we want, right? We're doing some outcome-based planning. We want to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Let's put our money where our mouth is. But, uh, you know, there are some things in the law that are pretty strong. So, for example, if a transportation project, be it a highway project or even a not particularly well-targeted or designed transit extension, doesn't actually help you meet your greenhouse gas emission reduction targets, you can't fund it. That's crystal clear, really strong. On the land use side of things, California is local land use uber alles. It's cities, counties, we have every single bit of control over zoning and no one dare touch it, penalty of death, uh, third rail. So originally this bill said, all right, and you know, you gotta make the land use at the local level match this plan that reduces greenhouse gas emissions. Well, that got cut in like day two of the legislative session. So, uh, when the advocacy community looked at, in the Bay Area, looked at, hey, we have this opportunity with this bill, the conversation is all about, we gotta link the transportation funding to the land use. We set a goal for ourselves as advocates, we wanna make that link real and really actually link some transportation dollars to local cities and counties doing their part for density near transit, for affordable housing, for all the good livable communities elements that we all wanna see. So, uh, I'm gonna ask you to play a little visioning game with me. Imagine for one moment that you are a city manager. You're managing a city that's, let's say, you know, relatively kind of small, medium-sized, population between like 50,000 and 100, 120,000, something like that. And you are offered some amount of transportation money in exchange for changing your zoning in your downtowns and transit areas to allow for more density, higher heights, affordable housing, you know, for the next generation, all the stuff that most of the people who already live in your community kind of don't want or are a little bit skeptical about, et cetera. How much money do you think that you would need as a city manager to say, all right, I'm gonna change my zoning, I'm gonna go in a TOD direction. And so you can answer this in one of two ways. So this is like annual, annual capital dollars, right? You can fix your potholes, you can do all the stuff you've wanted to do for transportation, don't have any money to do because you're a poor city. Uh, you know, do you think you, give me, give me a range, you know, do you think you need like $200,000, $2 million, <clears throat> $20 million a year in order to, to change your land use policies? $2,000, plenty. Who says, uh, I need at least a million bucks a year to change my land use zoning for the next year, get through all that political stuff. At least a million bucks, right? Not, not, a, not a small sale, a million bucks doesn't go very far to change, uh, to, to fix all your potholes, right? You got a lot of potholes. Well, I am going to tell you how much money the Bay Area ended up putting towards this grant program that the advocates successfully got passed, and then later, I will tell you whether it worked. So, the answer was, we put together, well, we, I, the advocacy community can't take total credit. Our MPO did a great job of like moving this forward, et cetera. We ended up passing what was called the One Bay Area Grant Program, which was a program, it's a pilot of $320 million over four years. So $80 million a year, we have 110 local cities and counties in the Bay Area. You know, if it were spread evenly, which it's not, but that's like, you know, $700,000 or so for you as a city. Is that gonna be enough for you to sell out your land use for the next generation? I'll tell you. So let me tell you a little bit more about the program first. So things, uh, some features of this One Bay Area grant program. Uh, funds are distributed 
uh, two counties based partially on things like housing production, production of affordable housing, and RENA, which is our acronym for future uh, targets for production of housing and affordable housing. Super exciting, right? Here we got, how are you doing on building your housing? Doing your, uh, doing your TOD? Depends how much money you get. Uh, we also, the program also combines a whole bunch of funding programs, including local streets maintenance, bike stuff, uh, transportation for livable communities was kind of our smart growth program, <clears throat> into this one big grant program. Uh, it uses uh, federal SDP CMAC money. And then uh, the other exciting thing is that a certain percentage of the funds need to be spent in what are called priority development areas, which are these places near transit where cities are planning for more development. So really geographically limiting for the cities uh, where they can spend the money. And my, uh, my personal favorite piece is that cities have to meet minimum standards to actually get their funds. So to be eligible for the grants, you have to have a certified housing element, which means you've defined and zoned for places to meet your future housing need. Almost no cities like to do that. And a complete streets resolution for all sorts of users. So now that I've told you these main kind of features of this grant, uh, do you think people liked it? Was it, was it popular? Or, or do you think there were any concerns from, uh, from different constituencies with different pieces of, uh, of these grants? So cities, advocates, anyone, anyone worried about some, some of the components of this program? Who, who might be worried about what piece? The tea, tea party? <laughs> the tea party is worried about the whole damn thing, but fortunately, <laughs> fortunately we were able to outnumber the tea party. That was, that was good news. Did I see someone else? Worries. Definitely, yep. Not, not dissimilar from the Tea Party folks. So folks who didn't want to see these types of changes opposed to, to putting these strings on them. Mm-hmm. Existing residents. What, what about the cities? What about the, the, the local government folks? Did, do you think they thought this was a good idea or anything that they might not like? I mean, I would say local control was a big deal. And yeah. even the different types of, you know, what that control looks like. And this looks like all the same from each town from the top down, what could happen in that city. Yep. City folks had some concerns. How about how about those of us in the advocacy community? I mean, folks who are out there looking for looking for the social justice pieces. Uh, looking for uh, achieving our goals. Any, any concerns about the way this is being structured that might be concerning? Danny. Well, certified housing elements do not generate um, affordable units. It's only a document. Policies, uh, that they're not strong point. enough, right? Okay, so, so you, you've hit on most of the concerns here, right? So, but, but what I'll add, so advocates were also concerned about this thing, where all the pots of funding were being smooshed into this one big pot of funding. They said, well, what about my bike program? You know, now it's this one big grant program. What if no one funds any bike projects anymore and they all just want to fund potholes, 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 you know? So advocates are concerned about that. Then you've got, uh, then you've got the transportation folks who are saying, you know, sure, we have these little tiny areas near transit where we want to grow, but can we really spend 70% of our dollars there? What about all of our local roads that we need to maintain? This is crazy. And then you've got the local government folks who are saying local control, who are you to tell me what to do, et cetera. And the advocates saying, this isn't nearly enough. You know, where is displacement prevention policies? You know, we need to go a lot farther with these minimum standards. So controversial program. At the end of the day, my sense is this is, a, this is a, an improvement, and it's a first step forward. But I'll just uh, say my last couple things about did we succeed? Um, so. You know, we shifted this distribution formula, right? How are we distributing these funds? We're weighting them based on affordable housing production, et cetera, et cetera. That did result in a shift uh, in terms of who was getting funding and the places that were in most need and doing the best job were actually getting rewarded. So that was exciting. It was pretty small. Uh, so population was still a big piece of that, so we have a little bit further to go. Uh, a bunch of good projects were funded to support these priority development areas near transit, so TOD projects. Uh, the piece I was most excited about was that these minimum standards, you know, as, as tiny as they were to begin with, you know, they really worked. You know, 700,000 bucks maybe 
cities were scrambling to put these things in place so they could be eligible for these grants. I couldn't believe it. So I think, I mean, if there's one thing you take away from this particular session, tiny amounts of money can go a long, long way towards getting cities to even do these terrible things around changing their land use. However, we're only about halfway there. We have places to go. Uh, four years, this is the pilot program. Four years later, it's coming back for review. So we want to increase the total amount of money in the program. We want to decrease population in that distribution formula. And I think for advocates, the thing we want the most is really to add to those minimum eligibility standards, making sure displacement prevention policies and other things are part of uh, linking that land use to the transportation funding because it's so successful. It's such a pleasure to be your testosterone for the afternoon. <laughs> I think they're just needling me. I also, I, I'm going to be a little different. I'm. Um, I'm going to probably have too many words on my slides. They'll look exactly like uh, what somebody would have given you as a lecture for what you should not do with a slideshow. Too many, too many words. Oh, well, you know, can't help it. I'm also not going to talk so much about local uh, stuff. I mean, we've talked last year and the year before about Measure R and building a business, labor, and environmental community and faith-based community coalition to pass a preposterous half cent sales tax in Los Angeles County that has about 70% of its money spent on transit. That's about $36 billion over 30 years, comes out to about oh, 25 or six billion for transit alone. It was pretty remarkable. What was remarkable was also the, what happened on this morning when we were celebrating that victory, gathered at the uh, Wilshire Western uh, uh, subway station and everybody really getting the same worried feeling about oh my god we just passed measure R 30 years of of 36 billion dollars and then we go 30 years oh my, we need all we need all of this now how can we possibly wait 30 years and so we started to think about out loud about so what is the what is a strategy for um, accelerated. Well, it's not that tricky really. You've got to borrow money. But the trick is to find out where you can borrow money on favorable enough terms so that you can afford to borrow it and accelerate your project. Because it turns out that the 30-year program is only 30 years really because the cash flow, it's, that's, that's what happens when you pay it down as the money comes in. You can accelerate the projects if you can borrow um, and get the money more like up front. But you can, that's only a smart thing to do if the interest rates are low enough. Now who might do something of scale for and relevant to this kind of program? And we began to think about the federal government as our friend possibly in this. You know, it's, we have a conflicted relationship like every citizen does with this government um, about whether, whether this was a possible. And we knew that there were, you know, D fiscal travails, especially I think in transportation on the federal level. So how could you possibly come up with a program or a strategy that might interest them when they're, you know, a new idea now when we're retrenching on most of our old ideas? Um, and that is what led to, um, well, let's see, I have to move forward here. Well, there's the groovy map. I told you all that already. Oh, I told you that. And how do we accelerate it? Here we are. And that's, um, that groovy map is, uh, is the map of the Measure R build-out program. It is kind of groovy. In fact, well, people love maps. You know, it's like an aerial view of the world as we'll see it in the future. Who could loan us enough money, low enough interest? I've done this already. What would it mean? It would mean building 12 lines in 30 years. It would mean accelerating all kinds of benefits. Jobs faster, economic, economic efficiency faster and economic competitiveness faster. It would mean accelerating the transition to transit going to the land use. Some of you are laughing at me, and that's not fair because you're not telling me why. Why are you laughing? Yeah, because we've from 10 years to 30 years. So yeah. if you're actually We're doing it backwards now. Right. Yeah, the 30 years so are backwards. Backwards. The estrogen would have gotten it right, but that's what <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> All right, well, I'll have to beat up on Gerard for that because he made the slide, so. <laughs> of course, of course. Okay. Wait a minute. It is characteristic of our half of the species to not proofread what we do. <laughs> but we accelerate also. <laughs> this is taped, my God. <laughs> to accelerate the environmental benefits. So this was, of course, for a long time environmental activist like myself, this was one of the things which was really uh, most compelling, especially when you began to imagine uh, this kind of program as a model for other kinds of transportation programs and what do we need to accelerate? Well, we really need to accelerate our reduction of greenhouse gases. So we need to be thinking about this perhaps as having a broader application. So that gave us a, a sense of purpose and a sense of mission about this uh, program. But we also learned um, that it would be easier to gain political support for a new program like this because it had one big advantage compared to the grant program, which was namely if the federal government makes a loan, it presumably is expecting to get paid back. And it means um, that you can spread resources around to more communities. This turns out to be a really huge benefit because if you take a billion dollars, for example, you can make a billion dollar grant to, say, one community. Or if you use it to be the lost reserve for a financing strategy, you can make 10 $1 billion low interest loans to 10 communities. Now, to me, what that means, each of those communities, of course, would rather have a grant. But now you've got 10 of them moving it. And if 10 of them are moving it, believing they can, you've got much greater prospect of success. And greater prospect of success means more motivation to try. And that really means more, I think, uh, planning and development effort on a local level because winning the jackpot is not such a remote possibility. And a smart federal lender actually could amplify this kind of program by using what they call a master credit agreement, what you and I kind of know as a line of credit. And what a line of credit is, is like a pre-approved financing that you don't get the money right away and you don't pay on it either, but you draw it down as you need it. And so with a pre-approved financing program, suddenly, um, you know, you got, you got a program that's got multiple projects all being accelerated, meaning they're being able to be planned concurrently uh, rather, rather than consecutively, because you know that when you get to the moment of truth, you're going to be able to draw it down. Now, it turns out that it has important benefits on a local level as well. And this is the kind of thing that really started to excite me, because I'm always thinking about how do we build a coalition for yes? Because in California, you know, it's not that you have to go to the ballot for, all, for any money for anything real. It's that you have to go to the ballot and win two-thirds. Oh, my God. Do you know how difficult that is? That means you've got to get everybody on board, getting people to yes. Accelerating multiple projects means, in a sense, that everybody's project gets on a kind of fast track development. So we got 12 projects in Los Angeles County in our Measure R. And believe me, it was a wrestling match trying to get people to yes about that. But if we would have been able to say, but all your projects can get built in 10 years, whoop, altogether different political logic. No longer are people scratching and clawing to get to see who's first in line for their project and worrying about whether the money's gone by the time they get to, to their project. That's the stuff that really makes it hard to build a local coalition to yes. But now that queue is moving fast. Nobody needs to take cuts because it's moving much more quickly. And that means getting our community uh, to consensus is much easier, much easier to accomplish. It also means that if you're doing that, you're not just planning one project at a time. You start to, start to plan systems. You start to look at connectivity uh, more actively. You start, because you're dealing with multiple projects at any one given time. And that, I think, is um, um, a potentially significant advance for our community's transportation planning. System planning, uh, easier consensus building, therefore much easier to get to yes, much easier to raise the money, much easier to be in a position to take advantage of a federal program. 
Now, we don't see this as an alternative to the traditional new starts and grant, pro grant programs the federal government has given and needs to continue to give and needs to grow, but rather it's a companion program um, that we need to see as a new and better role for the federal government that might in fact turn out, you know, there's this whole discussion about, what, what's that book? Metropolitan Revolution. About whether or not there's a whole shift in the way uh, investments are being made in our, in our nation, where the federal government's role is declining and the role of localities is, uh, is growing. Um, many people say it's because local voters are closer to the decision makers, they're more trusting, they're more willing, et cetera, et cetera. Well, I don't, I don't want to argue the case of whether that's a virtue or a, a, or a disadvantage. What I want to make sure is we turn it to a virtue as much as we are able to. And if we can create a program like this on the federal level that then says to localities who generate their own local money for their projects that we can accelerate and help you build your program, help you do more system planning, um, and have it all get done faster, better, I think uh, that's a virtue and we should strive to achieve that. The TIFIA expansion was one example um, in the last federal bill. You know, there was nothing new in that bill except lower money and TIFIA expansion. <laughs> and the TIFIA was the good one. Okay. And this is a direct government to government loan, low interest. And it's an opportunity now for every community in this nation on transportation. Okay. The second was um, the Ameri the second one, America Fast Forward Bond Program, is now pending. And this is where um, a private lender essentially buys Metro's bonds and the federal government gets tax credits to uh, um, pay down the interest rate, hopefully to zero. Now, why not, right? When we give grants, that's like a zero interest. So why not a grant that pays the interest? That's what a zero interest loan is. Um, and it can have, together, these two have some kind of spooky magic that uh, my financial friends tell me I must trust, but, and so I do. Um, because I couldn't possibly learn it or explain it. We are looking to a day when this will happen once again for LA County. We are looking to March, or not March, November 2016, where we expect to be able to put another measure on the ballot uh, in Los Angeles County that will be roughly twice what Measure R was. And that if this program we've just described is in place on a federal level, and we're able to, sell to, our, to tell to our community leaders that, look, you don't all have to wait in long 30-year lines to get something built. We can accelerate this program um, because we've got access to affordable financing to, on scale that can help us do it. We therefore can have our economic competitiveness, our clean air, our reduced greenhouse gases on a much more accelerated basis than we would have had before. Um, and this is the ragtag group that um, will have to, I guess, uh, do it again. Um, just to give you a bit of an idea of what we're working on now to make this happen, we've been uh, reaching out to mayors across the, across the country to build support for this notion. We're almost to 200. Now, a little help for the Conference of Mayors, but not, uh, most of it is just basic, you know, you gotta work it. You just gotta knock on the door, you gotta make the phone call, you gotta talk, you gotta explain to it. But when 200 mayors sign up for anything, Congress watches. We will be uh, working on getting our Chamber of Commerce to do the same kind of strategy to Chambers of Commerce across the nation and our labor movement friends to labor organizations across the country. But we're not just calling any old folks. We know who's on the committee in the House Transportation and Infrastructure Committee. We know who's in House Ways and Means. We know who's on Senate EPW and Senate uh, financing. We know who's the lead decision makers here. And I'll bet you if the mayor of Helena, Bozeman, uh, Missoula, uh, Billings, and what's that other city in Montana? <laughs> Are there, if there were four or five or six mayors from cities in Montana, that Max Bacchus is going to pay attention. So those 200 mayors are not just from any old town. They're from all those towns and those districts of David Vitter and you know, uh, Bud Schuster and the people who have to, um, and frankly, a little bit weighted toward Republicans because that's where we need, that's where we need the love. 
Um, so smart strategy can um, have a big vision for a federal program that can have dramatic consequences for our local level efforts, dramatically improve um, our ability to accelerate our infrastructure development, clean our air, and so on. And you can do it from your living room if you just learn how to use your tools. You know, there are nations around the world who have been on more rapid um, infrastructure projects. Most of them are not democratic. I think it's be a really remarkable thing for a democratic nations to learn how to do modernization and acceleration of clean infrastructure on an accelerated basis and do it democratically. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank all the panelists. I think uh, I, I'm not the only one in here who learned quite a bit. And now is we have plenty of time to ask the questions that you've been sitting there thinking about as you've been listening to these presentations. Um, Amy, who is walking around in the back, has a microphone. If you'd like to ask a question, raise your hand. You can direct it to any one member of the panel or ask a more general question. <laughs> We're going to see how fast she can move. Just make sure you, you alternate all, all the way across yeah. the room. Thank you. Joe Scala from Hennepin County, Minnesota. I'd like to direct this to Deborah as you talked about advocacy at a personal level. Mm -hmm. Little story, a couple of years ago, I and one of my colleagues met with a local community leader and we got into a very good discussion about outreach into a community. This was a neighborhood that was a candidate for a light rail line. Mm -hmm. There were people who supported the idea of light rail as a way to regenerate their neighborhood and bring in development. There are others who are afraid of it because of safety reasons and becoming a barrier in the neighborhood. And as our discussion continued, we kind of reached this, we all know this, but we never say it out loud. People like me, are in my, are, I'm in my cubicle working on this all day. Mm -hmm. There are people in these neighborhoods that are thinking about this mm -hmm. all day. And voila, we hold a meeting about once every two months for two hours. Mm -hmm. But what happens in those other 60 days? Mm -hmm. What rich thoughts are, are there in the communities that we never hear about? Mm -hmm. And what can we do about that? Right. Um, thank you for the question. Um, actually, what I would suggest is to partner with a community-based organization to hold those meetings so that the meetings are happening at times that are convenient to the residents. So in some cases, um, and, and it, it's cultural, like on Wednesday nights, not a good time in the African American community to have a meeting because that's Bible study. Um, Sunday morning, don't have a meeting. Um, so making sure that you're having meetings at the appropriate time for the community, but they, they need to be community led. So if you can empower if you will, ambassadors from the community to actually go back to their communities and have the community leaders decide when is it best to have this conversation and give them homework that they can bring back and say, so if you're talking about seven key issues, survey your neighbors and your friends and people who you go to church with in your community-based organizations and bring back this data, this is what we need, as opposed to rolling out your kit and bringing it to them to say, okay, which one do you like? They may not have enough time and enough information to process them. So also not making sure that, making sure that you don't do everything online because um, a, a lot of no, low wealth communities don't have access to um, the internet at home. And so making sure that it's as, as touchy-feely as possible from the community level it means that you need to make sure you empower community leaders to have that conversation and the conversation may look and sound different than if you would have it in another community. So just being respectful of those communities would I, I would say would be a better approach. Thank you. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> For you, Hillary, I was just curious about uh, the standards that you referred to. Yeah. If those were, if you came up with those as an organization, or if yeah. those are some best practices that you, that you found. So let me say, and that is actually those standards right there are a starting point. Okay, and I'm using them as a frame. So we're actually um, we're looking for performance measurements, right? Because oftentimes we do this planning, but we're never actually testing it to uh, how well we're doing. So we looked out to the world of performance measurements at the county and city level and then also at the neighborhood TOC level. 
Um, we found one called STAR, which is a national standard. Um, we, King County is one of the beta communities working um, through the STAR communities and we partnered with them. It is by no means perfect yet and actually we decided within that STAR that we're going to start with the equitable services and access context and then extrapolate it to a transit community context and bridge them. What we're finding is, is that in s every community is different. So one of the transit oriented communities we're working at is 98% single family residents. The one I showed you is largely commercial. Okay, but it needs to get to a multi-mixture of residential and commercial to really be a sustainable community. So we're using the standards within it. There's only four within the transit communities. We're bringing in equitable services and access for public space, parks and recreation, education, because we've got to stop working in silos and bring more what is a real healthy community look like. Food access and all that into it and saying, okay, as a community, here's, a, here's our starting point for performance measures. Are these the right ones for this community? And that's part of the community dialogue. So it's really just a frame. Rather than starting at zero and spending five years talking about performance measurements, which is usually what happens, it's a lot of work. We wanted to actually fast pace it, get up to it and say, here's a starting point. Is it right? Is it not? What would it mean? And then use that for the community to help design the performance measurements within these eight foundational community conditions. Great. We're going to go here first. Yeah, Hillary, this is yeah. for you too and kind of ties into yeah. the, the first question. Um, as you do the, the, the transit oriented development analytics, as you describe them, looking at the, the patterns and the existing conditions, there, there sort of creeps in the adult learning phenomenon, <laughs> which is engaging people mm -hmm. with that kind of conversation eventually creeps into the design issue of what could it look like, you know, how could it be different. Uh, not just in terms of the, the statistics on density and on walkability and so on, but actually getting a feel for what this area could be like and how I might fit into it uh, or my family might fit into it or people that currently aren't here could fit into it. Can you talk about how you integrate the design part of the process into the public involvement and conversations you're having? Yeah. So let me say we're very much in the early phase of it. I'm hoping by next year we'll have a lot more test case. We have finished the baseline assessment, which is huge, right? That's taken us nine months to do all the county and down the city. We've now developed the sort of the facilitated conversation. Um, and the design piece is the one we're going to start to go into the community and frame up, okay? So part of the conversation is bringing in, we're bringing in University of Washington students and others who have background in design to help to say, okay, as I heard what you said, so much of us are visual people here's what this street looks like right now. I heard you wanted more sidewalks. I heard you wanted maybe a public space in that transit community where you could convene or have a farmer's market or things like that. And do some visual kind of sketch ups within that and say, did that capture it, did it not? I would love to be honest with you, also bring in youth. So much of this is about youth engagement, not only to the, to the extent of reaching out to in a community meeting forum, but rather going out in the community and having the youth do the surveying and the discussion in the vision board context, but having youth actually draw it out on that. We're hoping to sort of bring a platform for lots of people of different ages to work in, but also bring in some design. Um, we'll, we're hoping to go out and get architects and others who want to put some of their time to this because it's such an innovative experiment of reaching into communities that don't usually have the resources. And really quickly, most often when we talk about this, people go, that's what cities are supposed to do. What we're hoping to do is give the tools that cities sometimes have had, because again, resource capacity, we're hoping to give it to the community-based organizations that are on the ground there who've always said, if I had these resources, I'd do it better. That's what our goal is and our hope. Am yeah, I on? There you go. Oh, okay. All right. So, um, one, we've our, our community. So we're one of the on the ground agencies in, in Minneapolis, Minnesota, um, where uh, we work with. We're in the same county as Joe. And one thing that we've started to do is engage youth because it, it, we have this, this these long range plans, and we go to the usual suspects that come to the meetings, and then you realize that this project's not going to hit the ground for five, six, seven, eight years. And those youth, the 18 year olds, those are gonna be the ones that are actually gonna be shaping, they're gonna be the users. Mm -hmm. And so that's one way that we've, we've addressed, well, what do you do about sustaining participation from residents over these long range projects? And so my question to you is, um, to you for sure, Deborah, 
and uh, we work on community benefits as well, our agency does, but how do you sustain participation from communities over a long course of time who don't understand the ins and outs, who don't breathe, and they're, they're not in these, these, uh, these policy meetings day in and day out? So good question. Um, first of all, we have a very active and robust internship program, so we always have youth um, at the table and in the room. Um, but what we do when we go out and canvass, we actually hire the youth to do the canvassing. And so we train the youth on what the issues are and actually get them to, to engage in the community. So the more you can involve them from soup to nuts, the better um, you'll, you'll have it. Um, also do a lot of the meetings in the schools. So if you have the PTA and the student council uh, as partners in the conversation, then the, it's more likely that the school will help to pick it up and to carry it on from class to class. We engage heavily with Georgia Tech and the Atlanta University Center um, and make sure that those students on campus actually do research projects that benefit what we do. One of the things that we've done um, at Stand Up is we partnered with Georgia Tech on a community action plan and we had youth in the community um, involved with a base closer, closing closing and we actually had them to for 22 months just listen to the community and so when Miss Johnson says well we really need a grocery store and we need fresh food in the neighborhood the students then went back and researched well what does it mean to have fresh food in the neighborhood these are the different options you can have you can have a community garden you can have a grocery store you can have a co-op you can have all of these things so that they listened they heard we taught them how to listen and here they did the research and then they came back and the, then presented respectfully to Mrs. Johnson and say, this is what we said you, we, we heard, is this right? And then bring your grandson so that they can see if that's what they want. Because oftentimes it's generational, the things that the seniors want are not necessarily the things that the youth want. So you're right on the point of, of carrying that message from generation to generation. Mm -hmm. Hello, I'm uh, Dick Burkhardt, a community advocate, citizen advocate for Southeast Seattle, but I'm really intrigued by the financing thing you discussed, Denny. Um, it's because, you know, the federal government uh, can actually just print money when it wants to, and it can charge any interest rate when it wants to, and the Federal Reserve does that all the time. They can give almost zero percent interest rates to the big banks. They could even do negative if they wanted to, and they can, it's almost arbitrary. Uh, is you know, I've, is that angle sort of ever fitting into this kind of financing you're doing? Is can you go up there and say, well, you can print money for for nothing? Can, wh why, why should you charge us any interest? Or is, is that what's or is that what is really happening when they're saying we'll pay the interest for you? Uh, what are the sort of the obstacles you have to work through and to get that cheap money? Well, I would never go to them and make it sound nearly so. Um, <laughs> arbitrary is that I think right. that there are that there are uh, policies and principles that underlie um, decisions that is made about what interest to charge etc and there is a cost to the federal government there's a scoring process for any of these uh, kinds of programs and then they have to compete with other kinds of expenditures in the, in the federal budget so it's not quite as simple as all that but it is I think um, uh, creates new opportunities that the federal government had not fully appreciated before, and certainly new opportunities that local level communities had not appreciated before. So there is some magic there that, that can be worked and become part of the institutional framework going forward. One over here, and then we'll come back over to this side. <laughs> no, we want to see you run. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, we're going to go to you, Amy, and then if you'll pass it down back to the back one. <laughs> <laughs> Just Thanks. throw it. Um, I, you're each working in a, a conversation at different scales um, that could be regarded as, as a, an impending deficit to a community or a community member. Mm -hmm. And I think you're each finding ways to talk about it in an asset or a potential for a better future framework. Um, so I wonder if you could to share some principles, some, some ideas that we might keep in mind as we're approaching communities with perspective change. Change is always frightening. Mm -hmm. And um, how, how do you bring that message of potential to improve the lives of the communities that we're working with instead of a potentially sort of deficit-oriented approach? 
I'm sure everyone will have some ideas for this one. Uh, one of the specific things that we ran into with this regional grant program was that they were going to be winners and losers. And some cities were going to be getting less transportation funding than they had previously received. So how do you even attempt to build any political will or disgruntled agreement to something like that? Uh, and so we actually did some work with a messaging firm to try to figure out how can we approach this. And what they ended up with was nobody wants traffic and everybody wants jobs. So, uh, so they made the case of, you know, there are, out of these 110 cities in the Bay Area, there are about a dozen that are slated to take on 80% of the growth moving forward in this kind of transit-oriented traffic reducing way. Uh, and, and also we have all these fabulous studies from uh, business organizations in the Bay Area saying that the lack of affordable homes and traffic are the biggest barriers to creating jobs in our region. So the message we ended up with was there are these 12 cities that have this responsibility. All of us, every single city in the region will sink or swim based on whether those 12 cities are able to succeed in this TOD to reduce traffic and to reduce housing costs and create jobs. And so it was kind of this, we're all in it together and the region will sink or swim uh, on traffic and jobs if you don't help these cities to succeed. So um, good question. One of the things that, um, first of all, I wanted to let you know we have copies in the back of materials on two chairs in the back so I didn't forget to, so I don't have to bring them home, so take them. <laughs> <laughs> um, but w in, in terms of future, um, what we look at, in, in I just have to throw it out there, in Atlanta, it's really a, a class um, conversation and a race conversation that people don't want to have. It's a, we have a polite southern culture that we don't want to talk about the reason why the train is not being built out in certain areas is because we don't want those people in our neighborhood. Um, but if we can frame the conversation as the asset that the community will bring to the neighborhood and the asset of good jobs in the neighborhood, it actually shifts the conversation on both sides. And so what we're trying to do is engage on different levels. So we are actually a part of a TLD table that we're the only community-based organization a part of that table. And so as we're talking about a TLD acquisition fund, we're saying, well, what about the equity? And what about you know workforce housing? And so framing it more in a way that's suitable to folks who may not want those people in their neighborhood actually helps us along the way. So you have to do education on both sides. You have to educate on the side of the community that really does want access to better housing and better um, jobs and also community education on the side that doesn't because we have a, a system that is only being funded by two counties. Um, and so there's the haves and have nots in a tale of two cities in our region. And so in order to shift that, we have to both educate the elected officials and the communities along the way. So it's a work in progress uh, and it's a continuous fight at, at, at some points, but I think that with new leadership, we're getting more and more to the middle. The, the only thing I would add is it's, it's all about shifting the conversation from the disempowered to the being empowered, right? And so the context is, is most of these situations, the transit station is largely already set. We've already had that discussion, and so it's coming. And it's not really about advocating to stop it from coming. The question now really is, is how do you use that moment, okay? Good or bad or ugly, whatever you think about it, how do you use that moment to get at kind of the problems or the issues that you have been seeing every day in your community? Whether it's the transit doesn't get you to the job you have or whether the jobs aren't right there in the community or whether the housing prices are gonna go up or whether you just don't have a grocery store and you've always wanted a grocery store right there or you don't have parks and recreation. And most often the average citizen back to has no understanding of how land use planning and policy works. But as we all know, largely in this room, it is the thing that sets whether that community is going to succeed or fail, frankly, with the exception of also community engagement, because you can't have great land use planning without great community engagement. That's the hope is by sh being able to finally connect sort of the dots that says you want this in your community, you've always want that. This is the tool that'll help you get there. How do we help your voice come out to the community? And that's the shift, I think, that is hopefully gonna move that. I think I would respond to um, 
to, to that challenge um, a little differently. I, uh, I find it uh, uh, troubling when fr my environmental friends um, um, believe or reduce resistance to um, transit, TOD, densification, et cetera, either to nimbyism or to fear of change. Because there are at least some things that might happen there, a paradox, if you will, um, that really are problematic. I mean, for example, uh, transit systems can do a very good job of reducing regional traffic, but they can also generate more localized traffic around the transit stations themselves. And I think too often our, um, my, my friends and allies will, will you know, be angry or dismissive to the local communities who then are resistant on that account, rather than finding a strategy that might help address and remedy that. Um, and I think that we need to put our attention to that um, so, that, um, um, so that we don't get unnecessary resistance. I mean, for example, one might um, think of a strategy that says, okay, we're gonna have certain flexibility in our parking strategies. And that flexibility we're going to use to finance, you know, transit passes to help ensure that a greater level of utilization occurs. Uh, maybe we might create some upsides uh, procedurally for the developer, but they got to pay a trip fee um, to help give them incentives to reduce trip generations locally when they're when they're adjacent to transit stations like that. But I really don't think it helps us solve the problem by just saying they're NIMBYs, forget it, they just, or they're just afraid of change and they don't know the wisdom of this. I think there are, traffic congestion's a problem. It's not imagination. I think we have time for two more. There's one here in the back and then there was one over here. Um, so I just wanted to actually kind of follow up a little bit on that. For Measure R in LA, um, Presumably you had a whole lot of polling to figure out what your messages would be to, to win, and you can tell from your photo that it's traffic was one of your arguments, but I wonder what other arguments were polled high for you and how you engaged with communities of color um, and other communities specifically in your campaign. Well, Measure R came together very quickly. It was not the product of a long-range um, um, strategy. It was a recognition of a moment of potential calamity uh, coming up against a moment of opportunity, which was the November 2008 election. So there was like one year between inception and election um, th that started that. So um, there was, there was um, as a result, I think there were lots of community organizing efforts that did not happen that should happen and should happen for the longer run. Um, in a sense, Measure R was a, a Hail Mary in the right pass, the right, the right quarterback at the right time, um, and the community was ready. But as to our messaging, uh, the jobs program, of course, November 2008 is, what, two months after uh, September 2008 when the economy collapsed, you know, that criminal activity that resulted in the collapse of all of our community security and welfare. Um, that happened two months before the election. And so that was a very, jobs were a very important part of the messaging at that point in time. We'll take our last question over here and then we'll have a little bit of wrap up. Um, sorry, she was, uh, she had her hand up first. <laughs> yeah, for the recording especially, if you'll use the mic, that would be great. My name is Emily. I work at a local nonprofit and I do advocacy programs. And I have a question for Deborah. You talked about your policy institute, the eight week mm -hmm. program. And I was, I run a similar program um, here in Seattle and mm -hmm. I'm always looking to improve it. And so I was wondering if you could give a snapshot of that program and then talk a little bit about how you engage the students after they graduate. Great. 
So what we do is we actually um, engage um, professors from the universities um, that we're in partnership with to actually come and give an hour or two of their time um, over the course of the eight weeks. And we talk about race, class, the regional economy, how to move things at City Hall, what's happening at the state capitol, and even what you're doing as a community member in your own community. And so part of what we try to do is to cross-pollinate each other's movement. So we actually get community leaders in the, the Leadership Institute. You have to be running something, um, a community leader um, or a student leader already to be in our class because we choose the students based on not what they're just doing now but what they also want to do because they have to apply for the program. We do have scholarships available as well. We actually ask unions to participate as well because the whole goal is to sh try to shift the mindset of everyone in the class so that we'll, people will begin to work together and out of their own silos. And so with the university professors, we get them, and we've been doing it, I guess we've done about 11 classes over the last five years. Um, and so we've been doing it, so we have it down to a science with who our instructors are, and we understand their analysis, and so we know that we have to move people in a certain way. So we start with a Harvey Newman that talks about the history of Atlanta and how it started on a railroad track. And it was the end of the line, it was terminus, and how Atlanta, was always a big a big picture idea place and then they had to figure out how to get it done and so we kind of use those examples to show them that they can do it as well in their own communities but we also do a class project where each each student has to choose a different group and they can't be in a group with someone else that they know so that at the end of it they're not only forming that bond but they're making presentations back to their class and oftentimes they go out and they advocate for whatever their issue is a couple of years ago we had a group that went out and they were really concerned about child prostitution and so they went out and they literally went out and talked to the prostitutes um, dressed up in the whole nine yards went to court and jail and talked to to them and 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 really that advocacy became a policy with the county um, and they taped it and it became a PBS special I mean so that's one of those things that was a rare opportunity for people to kind of dig deep in, a, in an issue. But they get to choose the issue, and if we're looking at a particular issue, whether it's a base closure or a transit-oriented development project, we try to help them with two or three issues they, they may want to choose from. And we select the class. The important thing about it is selecting the class with like-minded people that come to um, the class from different approaches. So you have, I always say Mrs. Johnson, so you have Mrs. Johnson who may be the neighborhood advocate in the room with the Sierra Club person. And so, so that she begins to talk to, and we pair them up. And so they begin to talk about, well, what does it take to get your community more into sustainability? And what does it take to your, your community to get people like me in your meetings? So it's, and, and as, as a result, they, we always have a graduation. Um, they get their certificate, and it's amazing that, you know, it's now six, seven, eight years later when I go into people's offices and I see our certificate up there framed, and it's like, really? Okay, I guess we're doing something. But what we found is, is that those folks tend to be the best allies and the best, best activists and advocates. When we put a, a call out to come to City Hall, the people that have come through our training program, we can spot them in the room. They don't even have to say that they're stand up. They, you know, we, can, we know who they are because we know that they've been trained and they're coming with a certain level of passion. Thank you. I'll be happy to talk to you afterwards. I'm going to give um, each of you about two minutes, one minute to two minutes at the end. If there's uh, any one thing that you would like our, our folks to take away in terms of especially community-based organizations, active advocacy, um, you know, something to keep in mind that might be new. Why don't you go ahead and start, Denny, at that end, and we'll work this way. Well, you didn't give me much opportunity to formulate my idea. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I guess that I would, I would like uh, folks to appreciate the message here is that uh, there are opportunities for us on a local level to learn how to organize and campaign effectively to in fact affect national policy in a way that can be transformational for our communities on a local level. Um, and I think the America Fast Forward Bond Program together with the TIFIA program illustrate that um, and I would encourage your support and engagement with that um, 
And then let's think of the other ideas that might have similar kinds of transformational potential. Well, Green Belt Alliance does a lot of local community organizing as well, which I didn't really talk about today. So I'll use my wrap up minute to two to actually say a few thing, more things that were spurred in my mind by Amy's question about you know, messaging when there's community opposition. And I guess I would say one thing we found over the years is that messaging really doesn't work. I mean, you just, you just can't kind of message your way out of people being concerned about change in their community. So we've chosen three other ways to deal with people being concerned about change in their community. One is the one Denny mentioned, solve the problem, right? So if there's something that you can solve without compromising your vision for good, equitable TOD, do that. You know, neighbors are concerned that there's you know, sites redeveloping and it has this Michael's Craft Store. Well, you know what, if, if the developer can work with Michaels and save Michaels, that's great. You know, if, if folks are concerned about, you know, oh, I'm concerned about where the exit route is for this new apartment complex that's going to exit onto my neighborhood street, if you can move the exit onto a busier arterial, that's great. However, oftentimes you really can't solve the problem without compromising your own vision, right? We want to reduce heights to two stories. Well, you can't really meet your TED goals with reducing heights. So then I resort to bribery, which is, you know, in a hot market, if you allow a developer to build higher heights, build less parking, whatever it is, we can use some of that to fund a nice neighborhood park. Do you want a nice neighborhood park? You know, do you want a child care center? What, what do you need? Uh, so bribery is very successful. And in the absence of those options, especially in less hot markets where you can't necessarily get a lot of money to bribe, uh, it really just is about out organizing. And I, you know, that's a hard thing to do because People don't want to spend their Thursday nights at the city council meeting to say, yes, yeah, this is going in the right direction. Yeah, I'm okay with this development in my community. Um, but one thing that I think, I think can be very helpful, um, we found even in the most NIMBY towns of the Bay Area, like Palo Alto, if anyone's heard of Palo Alto, California, uh, if a development proposal goes to a voter referendum, there's a silent majority of voters who will support it. So if you can help kind of make those arguments, maybe get the city council to do a poll, something like that, uh, you can show them that, look, the voters are behind you, even if there's this super loud vocal minority that's in opposition. So I'm just gonna wrap up my two minutes with what I learned as a local government official. Um, so number one fact, if we're really trying to get to healthy, equitable, sustainable communities, the fact is one policy at a time won't work, okay? So fact is, I hate to say it, but local government isn't the answer. And the reality is, is because local government works at just largely a policy and infrastructure frame. What we need is citizens who are engaged. And to get them engaged, it doesn't mean coming to a meeting. It actually means when have we, you yourself, we work day in and day out. I was a local government official. I stopped going to my city council meetings after I was no longer a city council member. Why? I have three boys, a farm with pigs, chickens, and goats, and a full-time job running a nonprofit statewide. And what I realized right then is I don't have the time and resources. But when people get engaged is when they own the solution, right? That's when we engage in everything we do, whether it's our children, school, or our job. It's when we are part of the solution. And so the key is and giving our citizens the opportunity to be that solution. And if you do that, you won't just get one policy adopted. You'll go, wow, I got a success, I got a policy adopted, but now I gotta go build it, right? And it just builds on the momentum because as each citizen talks about their success and how they help build it, they build community engagement with their friends and the others and it all of a sudden has an opportunity to be a huge success that isn't just a one-off meeting, but is instead saying this was built. And I've done this before where it's like hugely successful where literally 50 citizens will come every Thursday night from 7 to 9 p.m. for nine months, okay? And it's only because it's them that's creating the solution rather than the government saying, show up, show up, I'll feed you, maybe. No, not anymore, I've run out of money. <laughs> um, and so I think the only other thing I'd say to that is that not all citizens have the wherewithal to do that, right? So we need the community-based organizations who can put the arms around them to say, we're not gonna tell you what to say, but instead we're gonna give you the resources you need. Okay, you need data. Okay, oh, you need help crafting what that story is. Okay, what you need maybe is that advocacy training um, or and where to go and how to do it, right? Um, and the more we can build those, the more we can actually move, go as community-based organizations from one community to the next community, and we can go and actually step out of the community and say, they can do this. They don't need us anymore, and that's the key.
that's what she said. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I would just piggyback and say, you know, organize, advocate, um, be respectful of the, of the communities. Um, I do agree you have to have food at the meetings. <laughs> um, <laughs> engage youth and students, definitely. Um, but really build coalitions. There are so many organizations that w are working in silos that are not connected. And so engage with them on their issues so that they will support you on your issues. Um, and utilize the existing resources in the communities, the schools, the churches, the community-based organizations that are already there. Um, find out more about community benefit agreements. Read Michael Dobbin's book, and I think it's called, um, what is it, Urban Design and People, because often he's a planner at Georgia Tech, former commissioner of, um, of um, planning for the city of Atlanta, and he really just kind of flips planning on its head and say that it has to have people involved with it every step of the way or it's just not going to work. And then just really be respectful of communities. Um, if, they're, if you're trying to get something passed and you really know it's going to be a good thing, whether it's a transit-oriented development project or a transit project or anything else that you're doing, go and listen to them. Hear from the Mrs. Johnsons of the world to say, what is her problem? So don't just come in and say, okay, well, you need a station because that station is going to help you and your, your, your community. Ask her the question, how can this station help you in your community? What do you need and how can we help you get that? Oftentimes something as simple as giving someone the access to a computer or paper will really help a community if they don't have those resources. So partner with smaller community-based organizations that really need help and be authentic partners and support them along the way, get them the skills and the training so that they can stand up in the city council meetings and speak for themselves so that we're not doing it for them. Thank you. I wanna thank all of you uh, because when I think about the many faces of advocacy, these are the faces that are out there doing the work and, um, and moving the, the goal toward equitable TOD choices for everyone forward. So as we give our panelists a hand, give yourselves a hand as well. Thank you. Thank you.